1 Samuel chapter 16. So let me give you a little bit of the backstory. I, I, I shared just briefly in our prayer moment this uh, past Sunday, but let me give you a little bit of the backstory um, of this text. It wasn't too many chapters before where Israel had asked for a king and where God said to Samuel, I want you to go and anoint Saul. And it said that, that Saul stood head and shoulders above the rest. Saul was like the original head and shoulders spokesperson. With all due respect to the great Troy Palomalu and all the Steelers fans in the house said an amen. With all great, all, all due respect to Troy, like Saul, Saul, Saul was the original head and shoulders. He, Saul was anointed. He was called. Saul was used by God to do amazing things. And then God told Saul, I want you to fight the Amalekites. And so this happened in chapter 15 of the book of Samuel. And so Saul went out and fought the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were a representation of evil. They were a representation of sin. And God doesn't take evil lightly. He doesn't take sin lightly. And so God told Saul, I want you to annihilate the Amalekites. In other words, God was saying, I don't want you to put up with just a little bit of sin, a little bit of wickedness. I want it all to be gone. Every sheep, every goat, every man, every woman, every, like everything. I need you to annihilate all of these. And so I want to pick this up now in 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning at verse 7, it says, And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag and the king of the Amalekites alive, and he devoted to destruction all of the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. And all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. And it's because of that that when you flip over to chapter 16, verse 14, it says this, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. It's one of the scariest Verses in all of scripture to me. That here you had this man of God who was called. Here you had this man of God who was anointed. Here you had this man of God that was raised up to do amazing things. And just a few chapters later, it said that the spirit of God was removed from Saul. I just began to, to be burdened in my heart that I, I, I don't ever want to be yesterday's man. I don't ever want to be yesterday's church. I don't ever want to depend on yesterday's move. I don't want to preach yesterday's sermons. I don't want to read just yesterday's books. I don't want to tell yesterday's stories. Like I'm thankful for them, but church, we must operate in today's anointing. We must operate in today's move. There is a new move of God that is happening. The Bible says that Behold, I am rising up. I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it, says the Lord. We have to be aware of what God is doing. If I were to ask you, if I were to ask you, hey, hey, tell me, tell me about your marriage. Tell me about your marriage. And you said, oh, pastor, we had the greatest first year anniversary. It was amazing. We went to, we went to Charleston. Pastor, we got some low country cooking, shrimp and grits. We went to the Isle of Palms. We walked on the, we walked on the beach. Oh, I'm telling you, Pastor, it was an amazing first year anniversary. And if I followed up and just said, well, what well, can you tell me? Like, how long have you been married? And if your answer is like 32 years, I would respectfully say to you, that's not the question. And can I tell you that I feel like there are too many Christians that are living in a past experience and trying to pretend like it's fresh in their lives. I, I'm not asking you like what God did in your life 13 years ago. I'm not even asking what he did in your life 13 months ago. I'm asking what is God doing in your life today? 
Are we operating in today's anointing? The, the title of this is a little bit, bit strange. My subheading to this is a little bit strange, but I, I want to tell you how to lose the anointing. This is how to lose the anointing. Like there's a lot of things you can do to operate in the anointing, to grow in the anointing, to gain the anointing. This is how you lose the anointing. And we learn this from the life of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Number one is this in verse 12. Number one, if you make it all about you. If you make it all about you. So Saul comes to Samuel. Saul comes to Samuel. By the way, if God is constantly having to send people to check up on you to make sure that you've obeyed, you may not be in like great spiritual condition. So God is telling Saul to do something. He's like, then he's telling Samuel, go check up on my boy Saul. And so Samuel comes and he, and, and he walks in. And the first thing that he sees in verse 12, it says, and behold, he, he here is Saul. He set up a monument for himself I'm just telling you if you ever walk into the auditorium and there is a statue of Pastor Doug right here you can turn your little self around and march right back out those doors like Ichabod the glory has left the house if we make life about us instead of about the ministry that God wants to do through us, the glory of God will leave us. The anointing will leave us. And I know we don't set up monuments to ourselves on purpose, but I wonder if we set up monuments to ourselves accidentally, if our bank account, monuments to our bank account, monuments to our career, monuments to our children's success, monuments to our own opinion, and suddenly before we know it, we are worshiping at the altar. We are worshiping, I'm telling you, we have a culture that is worshiping at the idol of their own opinion rather than the word of God. And the glory of God and the anointing of God will not be upon you. It will not be upon you if you are worshiping at the altar of your opinion more than the ministry that God wants to do through you to reach lost and hurting and broken, broken people. Second thing is this. We lose the anointing when we keep a sheep. So Samuel then comes up to Saul and he says, uh, hey, Saul. God told you to destroy everything, right? Yeah, and Saul's like, yeah, everything. Everything, we destroy, destroyed it all. And, uh, and Saul's response, it even like, it's real, it's real holy. It's, re it's real religious. Pastor Kevin, he says, he says, Saul says this, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Can I just tell you, parents, if you say to your kids, did you mow the grass? And their response to you is, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the command. Something's up. I'm just telling you right now, something is up. You can't clothe your disobedience in religious pretense and spiritual language and expect God not to notice. He sees through it. Sees through it every time. Kate and Anna were, my, my kiddos were about four and two at the time, and uh, my wife was on the phone, and they'd, they'd snuck off to the refrigerator because she was in the other room, and they opened the refrigerator, and they got out a jar of chocolate icing, and they took that jar of, don't encourage my children like that. <laughs> they took that jar of icing into Anna's room, and they, and they hid behind the curtain, <laughs> Like, no, and no utensils, and he just, just, and Camden walks in, and she pulls back the curtain, and if she would have, I, I don't think they denied it in the moment, but if she would have said to them, I'm sorry, did you fully obey the commandment of the Lord? And they said, blessed be you in the name of the Lord. We have not eaten the chocolate icing. Well, you're, the circumstances around your mouth area are telling a different story, right? Like, so, y'all, Saul is a grown man. He is king of the nation. And Samuel says, did you kill all the sheep? And Saul's like, yeah, pretty sure I killed all the sheep. And Samuel says, there is a, then why do I hear sheep? Like, there are literal sheep just 
bleeding in the, in the background. And can I tell you that sometimes that we can put on religious airs and false pretense, but the sound coming from the hidden places in our lives betrays us. Can I just ask you today with the love of a pastor, what's behind the curtain? What's behind the curtain? Because I want you to operate in the fullness of your anointing. And sometimes what can happen in our lives is we can clean our hearts the way our kids clean our rooms we cannot clean. There is a difference. Y'all, there's a difference between cleaning your room and moving your mess. Come on, I'm about to, I'm about to help some marriages out there. There's a, there's a neat one and there's a messy one. There just is. Go ahead, neat people. I want to just give you the satisfaction. Just point to the messy one right now in your household. You can go ahead and just, we got, we got double pointing going on. There is, a, there, is a, there is a proper way. There is a proper way to load the dishwasher. Come on, some, somebody help me preach this. There's a proper way. You don't just throw in, you don't just throw it in there. Like there's a, because there, you, you want to maximize the space. So it's like a game of Tetris. So you don't take your lasagna pan and just throw it on the top. You like there's a, there's a there's an order to this. Some of you some of you are remembering your your college days with that with that one roommate. Like there is a there's a difference between cleaning cleaning your room is picking up all the dirty clothes and putting them in the hamper. Cleaning your room is putting away the games back in the containers they came out of. Cleaning is throwing the trash away. Cleaning is taking this trash out. Moving your mess is taking the clean dishes and dirty clothes and putting them in one pile. Uh, Moving your mess is taking that pile and throwing it, pushing it underneath the bed. Moving your mess is, is opening your dresser with one move of your arm, sweeping all the stuff in the dresser. You've lived with that roommate. You've lived with that person. In our lives, there's a difference between going to the Lord and cleaning our hearts and just moving our mess. And what Saul had become an expert in is just, I'm, I'm just going to move my mess. Because Saul cared more about what he looked about and what, how he looked in front of people than how he looked in front of the Lord. And when you care more about other people's opinion, you'll just move your mess. Uh, so I want to look good in front of my kids, so I'm just going to move my, I'm gonna move my mess so I look good in front of my kids. But now i got to go into a meeting, and I want to look good in, my, in front of my boss, so I'm just going to move my mess. And then I'm going to church on Sunday morning. I don't want to, the pastor to know about the hidden sheep that I got going on on my internet browsing history, even though you put Google in incognito mode. I don't want anybody to know, and so I'm just going to, I'm just going to move my mess. And here's what happens when we move our mess. We eventually get found out for the fraud that we are, but before you feel guilty and before the enemy tries to put shame on you, what you have to know is there's another sheep. There's another sheep. So if you've been trying to hide a sheep in your life, you got to know that there's another sheep. you got to know that there is a perfect lamb of God who's taken away the sin of the world. You have to know that there is a Savior who died for you, and you don't have to move your mess anymore. You don't have to live in shame anymore. You don't have to live with that thing hidden in your life anymore. If you would just take it before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and say, God, I'm sorry, God would have forgiven Saul. God would have, if Saul just would have said, oh, I, me- I messed up. I got a sheep back here. God, I'm, I'm so sorry. You told me to do something and I didn't fully obey. And if he would have stepped into obedience, I'm telling you, there's so many people that are living with unnecessary guilt and shame in their lives. You know, I, I, on this Memorial Day uh, on this Memorial Day weekend, I reminded, I picked this up a couple of years ago. It's, it's George Washington's farewell address to the nation, 17, 1796. Pastor Justin's in the house. He's a history guy. He's a, uh, 1796, George Washington gave his farewell address to the nation. It's really interesting. 
on this Memorial Day weekend. George Washington warned our nation, if you do these four things, the nation will collapse. Number one, if you set up a two-party system and that two-party system hates, hates each other, the nation will collapse. Number two, if you go into debt, the nation will collapse. Number three, if you lose your morality, the nation will collapse. Number four, if you lose your religion, the nation will collapse. There's a little bit of a sermon. Here, but here's what I don't understand. Do you know that in the Senate every year on George Washington's birthday, they gather in the Senate, they dress up real nice, they make a ceremony out of it. And do you know that a senator reads this word for word every single year? Forgive my bluntness. They put on a religious ceremony and read the words and walk out and most of them go and do otherwise. And a nation can't stand like that. But before we get real high and mighty, I wonder sometimes if the world looks at us and says, we don't understand how you read this thing on Sundays and walk out and do something else. Let's not do that, church. Let's live this thing. Let's live it. Let's let our lives be a testimony that the word of God is alive, that there is an anointing upon us today, that we want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the obedience of the word of God. I don't want to lose my anointing. The final way that Saul shows us that we lose our anointing is that we make excuses, <laughs> we blame others, and have a victim mindset. Here's Saul again. Saul, hey, hey bud, you got, you got a lot of icing on your face, and you're, you're hiding behind the curtain, and I hear the sheep, and then this is Saul's response. Saul said, my brother got the icing, and he force-fed it to me. Well, that's not exactly what he said, but he might as well. <laughs> Saul, the king says this. He says, they, they brought me. They, they brought them for the Amalekites. And then he says, the people, it's the people who spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. And here Saul begins to live in this, he's blaming other people. He's living in this, this blame. He's making excuses and, and blaming others. And he has this victim mindset. And, you know, an eight-year-old who blames the referee for the loss of the soccer game behind becomes the high school senior who blames the science teacher for his grade, who becomes the college student, who blames the church for their lack of faith, who becomes the graduate, who blames America when they can't get a job, who becomes the husband who blames his wife for the lack of fun and spontaneity in their marriage. I'm telling you, this blame and victim mentality has to stop. It's got to stop. It's not going to get you anywhere in life. It's not going to help you. It's not going to grow you. I'm not saying that you've had a perfect life. I'm not saying that things haven't been done to you. I'm not, I'm not saying that you haven't been wronged. I'm just saying that it's time to grow up and man up and woman up in the name of Jesus and take, just take responsibility for the sheep and admit it to the Lord and say, I made a mistake. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. But I'm so encouraged here in 1 Samuel 16, 1, because here's what happens. When the nation, when the nation is in distress, and when leadership, it seems like leadership is leading everybody away from the people of God, and when it seems like there's no hope, this is what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve? How long are you going to gr grieve? Maybe the Lord is saying to the church, how long are you going to grieve? Since I have rejected him from being king. But now he says this, fill your horn and oil with go and go. What we have to understand is that there is always a David generation. There's always a David generation. There's always somebody else that God has his eye on, that God has his hand on. There's always another generation that God is calling, that he is raising up, that says, I'm going to use this man or woman of God to lead the people of God back to God. In 1961, there was a young Bible college student in Wales, and he left Wales to go back to 
his home town in Germany. And on his way, he took a self-guided tour through England and he came across the home of an evangelist, a famed evangelist at that time in London by the name of George Jeffries. There's a little nameplate on the gate. The Bible college student, I wanna read you as he tells the rest of his story in his own words. He says, there I rang the bell and a lady opened the door. Pardon my intrusion, ma'am. Does, does George Jeffries live here? Yes, he does. Can, can I see him? No, under no circumstances. She had hardly said no when I heard a deep voice from within the house say, let the young man come in. I stepped forward, took his hand and introduced myself. And I told him I had a call of God on my life to be an evangelist, to preach the gospel in Africa. That I had been to college in, in Swaznia, was that Bible college in Wales and was now returning to Germany. And what happened next was extraordinary. All of a sudden, he took me by the shoulders and fell to his knees, pulling me to the floor with him. He placed his hands on my head and began to bless me as a father blesses a son, as Abraham blessed Isaac, who blessed Jacob, and on and on. The room seemed to light up with the glory of God as he poured out his prayer over me. I don't remember the words with which he blessed me, but I do remember their effect. My body felt electrified, tingling with divine energy. After about, a, after about a half hour, he finished, and I stood up and helped him to his feet. He seemed very frail. We said goodbye, and the lady came and escorted me away, and he could hardly stand, nor could I, but for different reasons. Church, that young man went on to become one of the greatest evangelists that our generation has ever known. His name was Reinhard Bonnke. Some people called him the apostle of Africa. And when he left that house and got on the train and got off the train and talked to his father, his father told him that when he got off the train, George Jeffries had just passed away. That was probably the last prayer that George Jeffries prayed was laying his hands on the next generation and believing that that call and that anointing was transferred on to him. Reinhard Bonnke went on to pray preach stadiums filled with people, hundreds of thousands of people in Africa. And I wonder if once again, the Lord is looking out over our teenagers, over our sons and daughters, over the next generation, over elementary school children. I wonder if once again, the Lord is saying, where are people with the heart of David? Where are worshipers? Where are warriors? Where are people who are seeking after? We can choose to live in the past and we can choose. There is a time to mourn after Saul but there is a time then to pick up the mantle and the Lord is saying that I am gathering the horn of oil again what if the Holy Spirit is even now moving over kids world what if he's even now moving over our youth and just saying I'm going to anoint somebody new I'm going to anoint somebody fresh in the house what if those, these summer camps this summer are part of the Lord raising up another generation of David's Church, can we be a part of that? Can we be a part? I'm telling you, as we bless forward to the next generation, the Lord will bless us. Samuel, Samuel was anointed powerfully by the Lord all the way through his life. You know what Samuel's ministry was? You know what it was? It was just Samuel, Pastor Justin, Samuel was a youth pastor. That's what he was. He just kept raising up the next generation. He just kept raising. Pastor Nikki, Samuel was a, was a kid's pastor. That's what Samuel did all his life. He just kept raising up the next generation. He just kept pouring out on the next generation. There are different ages and stages to that, right? Sometimes it's as a youth leader. I don't want to ever do that again in my entire life. I've done every retreat and breakaway. I don't want to, I don't want to ever do it, but I'll give. Now I'll I'll give and I'll, I'll from a different seat I'll raise my kids or a, a, a bit of uh, then I can be a grandparent like we can all we all have a different part in this right like maybe it's maybe it's paying for somebody else to go to summer camp maybe it's being a volunteer in kids and youth ministry on a Wednesday night maybe it we maybe maybe you're a teacher maybe we all have a part in this but church if we will operate in the Samuel anointing 
That's the key. So how to gain, how to lose the anointing, be like Saul. How to always operate in the anointing, always pass on to the next generation and bless the next generation and raise up the next generation. And this has always been a Samuel church. And if you're going to commit, if you would just commit to saying we always want to be a part of that, would you stand to your feet and just say, God, we want that. We want that Samuel anointing in our lives to pass on to the next generation. God, I thank you, Father. I thank you for the history of multiple at church. So we've always been about the next generation, but I pray for that first Sam, I pray for that Samuel anointing to come upon us. That we would preach and bless and raise up new ministries for the next generation, oh God. And I pray that you would now choose some Davids to raise up, to anoint, to bless, so that we can carry this forward in Jesus' name. Before anybody moves around, I just want to take a second and uh, just slow down for a minute. Uh, I recognize that a lot of us here are part of the family of God and even part of our Multiply family here. But uh, for some of you, you've heard this message and it sounded great and it was really cool. Um, and it seems like God is moving through this book that we call to be the word of God, but you may not have that sort of relationship with the Bible. And one of the words that Pastor Doug was using a lot in this uh, sermon today was the word anointing. And that might be a bit confusing for some of you who may not be familiar with um, the Bible or what we're talking about when we're talking about anointing. But anointing is simply believing that whenever we give our allegiance over to God, that His Spirit is imparted to us and we are given the empowerment to live a life for His glory and no longer for sin. And whenever I say sin, I just mean the behaviors and the lifestyle that doesn't honor God according to the word that we have here in the Bible. And so some of you are in your, in your mind and your heart, you're feeling something go on right now and you're kind of like, I... I feel like I need to turn from these things in my past life. I feel like I need to turn from the darkness and the word sin, the things that don't honor God. And I need to turn unto him so that I can live this life that glorifies him because he's our creator and he desires that you are a part of his family to working for his kingdom in this world. And so I'm not going to ask anybody to bow your heads. I'm not going to ask anybody. It says no shame and no nothing weird going on here. But the, the reality is that there is a group of us here who want you to be a part of the family with us and to know that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life and he died on the cross so that you could have eternal life with God beginning now. And so if that's you here and you're like, I've, I've lived a sinful life and I'm ready to turn away from the past life that I was living and I want to step into right relationship with Jesus. I want to pledge my allegiance to Jesus Christ. If that's you, just I just want to ask you to raise your hand. Again, no shame. We're going to celebrate with you. I'm going to start, and I'm just going to look across the room. So just raise your hand. If you're done with sin, you're done with the ways of the world, and you want to turn to Jesus. See anybody up there? On the floor, anybody? Just raise your hand right there where you're at. I don't, I don't see anybody from here, but church family, I'll ask you if you see somebody around you that raised your hand that I didn't see, bring them out to the lobby. I want to connect with them in the lobby and have a conversation. So can we, can we pray as we close and just ask the Lord to bless us as we go? Lord, I ask that you would move in our hearts. Lord, mobilize your people by the power of your spirit to bring about the kingdom of God in our hearts and also through us so that the world might know that you have a love that tramples everything else in this world, Lord. We give the glory to you, Lord, and we pledge our allegiance to you from this moment forward. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen and amen. I hope the service today made a difference in your life. If you decided to follow Jesus, I would love to know. If you'll text ALIVE to 94000, we have some resources that we would love to give you that will help you as you continue to follow Jesus. To stay connected all throughout the week, check out our app. You can find it on your app store by searching for Multiply Church Family. Thanks for joining us today. I can't wait to see you again.